chance to kind of saunter in and walk around a little bit and then and then come over. And we might still have some people coming in, um, which is just fine. But, um, so uh, my name's Matt Berlin, and I'm the uh, environmental program coordinator with the city of Portland uh, with the Sustainable Stormwater Division. Um, I think I've met a couple of folks, and, uh, and it's nice to see familiar faces. Um, this is kind of a warm-up class, um, not a class, but a brief presentation. It's kind of a warm-up for people that don't know what eco-roofs are all about, um, and pretty general. So if you have any questions while I'm going through, just holler them out at me, and we'll, we'll kind of have a, a conversation for the next, like, 30 minutes or so. Um, so you're all here, which is really great. It's great to have you here, um, and it's uh, just a way to kick it off. Um, so we'll do just a brief overview, and this is about Portland-specific, um, so eco-roof specific to Portland's um, geography and the climate here, um, and uh, as we see things by the city and where uh, the people that live in Portland. So. So we'll talk a little bit about a healthy watershed, um, and then we'll talk about an eco-roof and why we support them, and then how there's ways that you can get involved in the resources that we have to help. This is a picture of our fair city, um, 140 square miles in size, and about a twelfth of that is roof space, and uh, a lot of that hard surfaces with our roads and um, pavement and rooftops, it creates a lot of stormwater runoff. And what it used to look like was all trees, right, before we came here and, and developed on it. And when you imagine what that does for a watershed, you know, if you think of the green color up here, it's all green. And those are all trees that are capturing and absorbing rain as it falls. And when you add in houses and buildings, naturally, and roads and highways, you get a lot of hard surface. And that creates a lot of stormwater runoff, as I mentioned, which leads to water pollution. It leads to flooding in certain areas of the city, um, stream bank erosion because the water that's running off is coming off at a high velocity. Um, we also have issues with basement sewer backups. Has anyone had a basement sewer backup? Good. I'm glad to hear that. It's probably the worst experience I think a property owner, a homeowner could have. Um, and a lot of that is because of our combined sewer system. Uh, the combined sewer actually manages our stormwater runoff and it manages our sewage and it puts it in the same place, but the system itself is pretty archaic. It was built for a certain capacity that we now exceed. So when you get those warnings not to go in the Willamette River, it's because we've exceeded that capacity. And it either goes out the pipe into the river or at times it can go back up the pipe into somebody's basement. And so the more stormwater that we create from all these hard surfaces that we use in development, the more runoff then goes to the pipes, which creates that um, capacity exceedance. So the typical way that we deal with this is with pipes. And everybody's heard of the big pipe, I hope, and uh, the, the project itself. Um, a couple of words about it. It's expensive and it long project, um, both of which um, will come to an end this year. But as rate payers, we'll all be paying for it. Um, for some time. That's part of the reason why our rates are so high here. Um, and this is a conventional approach. This is one project that's solving one problem, our combined sewer problem. And what, we'll talk, what we're talking about when we talk about eco-roofs is green infrastructure. It's the alternative to gray infrastructure. Um, and the basic tenets of that are that we preserve and maintain natural watershed processes. So when I was talking about the forested watershed earlier, it's recreating those processes with how water moves through the watershed, but doing that in the built environment. Um, trying to manage stormwater as, on uh, where it falls instead of um, conveying it to somewhere else and dealing with it there. Um, using plants and soil, um, and then preserving the capacity of our existing pipe infrastructure, and then trying to achieve other city goals. And so if you look at the middle picture, for example, it's a great... Um, it's a great shot of a project, a Green Street project in Northeast that was a very um, busy neighborhood street and traffic was a problem there. And so they were able to manage stormwater on site, but also calm traffic by bringing these Green Streets in. Um, it was a pilot project, but it showed how we could meet multiple benefits with these types of projects. So this is a shot of the Portland Industrial District. This is the Northwest Industrial District. And um, I usually ask the audience uh, um, 
what they see in this picture that uh, tells the story um, of stormwater issues in Portland. What's the first thing that you see here? A lot of rooftops, lot of rooftops. and parking lots. That's right. So there's a lot of hard surfaces and there's not any green surfaces. And then what else? There's one more thing. It's the river. Yeah. Um, so we've got all hard surfaces, no green space, and we've got the river that we care so much about, right? And the river obviously has water quality problems. It has, um, it's protected for certain species of fish. Uh, and so this really tells the whole story. Um, and we're moving away from development like this, but it still exists and we need to try to find a way to take advantage of how this development interacts with our, our rivers and streams and watersheds. And so the way that we look at doing that on rooftops, um, which is why I hope you guys came here today, is to look at utilizing the rooftop as a vegetated space to manage stormwater. So this is a picture um, from Linz, Austria. It's a similar industrial district, uh, but they've used eco roofs, vegetated roofs, or living roofs, or green roofs, um, depending on how you call it, um, to actually remove that footprint from the watershed there. And so they've used those plants um, in, an, in a district-sized development in order to manage the, that stormwater. And you can also see that they have a number of trees and a number of areas there where they're managing stormwater on site. And the intent is to create a development that actually has a smaller impact. So I include this slide uh, because, first of all, some people don't really know what an eco-roof is. And also, um, if you're in this business, you might have heard the term eco-roof used to describe a lot of different things. Um, and so it's important to kind of know what your terminologies are. Um, a green roof is a vegetated rooftop. And there are two kinds. There's an intensive and an extensive green roof. Um, and it's all based on the level of maintenance involved and the depth and the complexity of the system. And so um, an extensive green roof we call an eco-roof. And the reason that it's uh, called an eco-roof and an extensive green roof is that it's shallow soil and it's low maintenance and it actually operates as a stormwater management tool. When you think of a roof garden, they're deeper soils, and a lot of times you plant more um, types of plants in it, and often they require a lot more irrigation, especially during the extremes of our climate in Portland. So when you think about planting tomatoes on your rooftop, that's not really a way to manage stormwater, is it? Because in the summer, you've really got to irrigate that to keep it alive and well. Um, so while we absolutely support and promote the use of roof gardens to help with urban agriculture and to um, be creative with how we use roof space, it's not an effective stormwater management tool necessarily. So with an eco-roof, we look at a lightweight vegetated roof system. And it's the key elements there I've bolded. Um, lightweight is really um, why it starts to work so well. We've combined a lot of different elements, not we, but the collective we, have combined a lot of different elements, including a lightweight soil, um, plants that can survive the extremes of our climate, and then um, uh, it's not very deep, it's very shallow. So what you have is a system that doesn't put as much demand on the structure that you're building it on. It allows you to, be, to have a lot more options with types of buildings and the extent to which these buildings have to be retrofitted in order to actually use these systems on buildings. So for everybody that came in after I started, if you have questions, just go ahead and holler at me. Um, this is a very nice, comfortable, intimate setting, so welcome. Sir. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. This is my this is my plant in the audience asking questions. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the the simple answer is it weighs more, um, and so and that's important because when you think about your structure, it does weigh more than a conventional roof, which means you do have to make sure your structure can hold the additional weight. Um, we can't emphasize that enough because. It's not, you know, a lot of times I get questions like, do you guys just really just throw stuff up on the roof and expect it to, 
to hold it, and it's not really like that. We go through a very um, detailed and sophisticated permitting process for the weight. Um, so to answer your question, um, between 12 and 25 pounds per square foot is a good estimate, um, in addition to the, the weight of a conventional roof. Um, an even better estimate is to say that for every inch of soil that you have, it weighs about a pound per square foot when it's saturated. So a typical eco roof will be about three to four inches deep. So you're looking at between like 15 and 20 pounds. Yeah. Um, the cost is really kind of all over the map. It's like between five and $20 and actually it's really between two to three dollars and a hundred dollars per square foot. The, the market is really working in the ways that markets do where there's a lot of projects and materials out there that have their pros and their cons depending on your situation. The real bottom line about cost that I want to tell everyone today and that I scream from the mountaintops when I, whenever I can is that you can do it for five dollars a square foot and that's important. We're seeing on average costs per square foot coming down for these types of projects as people become um, more practical in their use, more sophisticated, more innovative in the way that they design these types of projects. Um, it's, it's creating a situation where the cost is actually becoming easier for property owners. A real key element of the eco roof is the type of plant material that we use. Um, and so, as I mentioned with tomatoes on rooftops, um, you have to love and care those very much during the time that you want the tomatoes to grow. And that's a very high maintenance approach. Um, what we promote with the city of Portland here, and this is a very climate specific thing, although it's used all over the world, um, drought tolerant succulents and grasses um, that don't require a lot of maintenance, nor do they require a lot of irrigation. So um, for those, does, is everyone here a Portlander? Is anyone from out of town? Okay, and where are you from? Uh, Michigan. Michigan, okay, if you don't mind me asking and putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, so, so if I were a uh, um, a landscape architect, I would probably need to know more about Michigan's climate before I could really talk to you about the plant material that I would recommend. But for Portlanders, you know that right now it will not stop raining. It just won't stop raining. It's been raining like crazy for weeks. It's driving me up the wall. But a couple of summers ago, it was 107 degrees for a week straight and it was dry and it hadn't rained for, you know, 40 days or something like that. So the plant material that you need to include on a low maintenance eco roof has to be able to withstand those extremes. Um, and so things like sedum and things like grasses um, are the types of plants that do really well after they get established. And we have a number of projects that actually don't get irrigated at all because they're able to live through those processes. Um, as you continue to uh, look at your project, if you're an aesthetic or if you like to have your green thumb in use, um, you, can, you can do things like irrigate and take care and manicure it to make it look nice. But when you think about it as a functional stormwater management tool on a rooftop, it actually can function very well after getting established without a lot of maintenance. Um, one very common question I get is that you need to have a flat roof for these types of projects. You don't need to have a flat roof. Um, we can have pitched roofs. We've seen a number of different projects um, on the worldwide scale of different um, orientations of roofs and different slopes of roofs. Uh, we've done a number of roofs on a 412 pitch, so just about like this. Um, and we're getting ready to start working on an A-frame project. Um, and so, are there any engineers in the room? It, it, engineering speaking, it does get more complicated that way. Um, and so structurally, it can raise the cost, obviously. Um, as you start to work with those forces that are on the structure, it becomes um, more complicated and then therefore can raise the cost. Um, so we don't see a lot of A-frame houses, but, but Europeans have a lot of different examples of that. And I think for us, it's all about trial and error and being able to do you know, these types of projects and learn from our mistakes and kind of work through it. It's not a very forgiving market to be trying things out on A-frame buildings. And, and the last thing I will say is that um, they're compatible with solar arrays. And this is just, this is a key point because a lot of times um, as we're looking at our 12,500 acres of roof space in Portland, um, there, it, there often seems like there's only one option to do on your roof. You can either do a conventional roof only or you can do a solar roof only or you can do a vegetated roof only. And it's actually not really the case. You can actually integrate all three of those if you wanted to. 
Um, and there's actually a couple of vendors in here that work with those types of systems. Um, one interesting thing about that is that um, solar panels have an optimal temperature. I'm not a solar expert, but um, I think it's between 85 and 90 degrees that they perform the best. When they get warmer than that, their output starts to go down. So when you have an integrated system, the plants cool the panels, which helps them stay at a more optimal temperature. The panels actually cover up the plants and they provide shade, which allows less stressful environment for the plants. So there's a nice symbiotic relationship. Um, and if you're interested and you've stopped by Portland State University's table in here, they have a great pilot project that, that they're working on at the Science Building. And um, they've got a lot of information about what they've learned from that project. It's an integrated pilot project that they're working on. Any questions before I jump forward? So, um, you know, I, I provide these slides. You all probably know about this, but I provide these because this is how the city of Portland looks at eco roofs, and so there's a lot of different benefits that we promote. Um, if you're a rate payer in Portland, the bureau that I work for is the people that you pay your stormwater fees to. And we operate and maintain our sewer system and our stormwater system, the big pipes that I was talking about earlier. Um, so first and foremost, we talk about reducing stormwater flow and stormwater volume. Um, from our monitoring, we found that a, an eco roof can reduce stormwater volume by 50% on the rooftops downtown. So just having a three inch eco roof on the Portland building where, where, where we work reduces the volume of it by half. Can anyone guess how much um, of the peak flow is reduced? That's all the water that hits the pipe from the building at once on a conventional building? 98. 98%. This is effective. This is really cool. When it comes to the issues of combined sewer overflows, this is an effective tool at reducing two of the major problems we have, the volume of water and then how fast it hits the pipes at the same time. So not only is it reducing peak flow, but if you think about energy, it's reducing the effect of all that energy hitting our pipes that are 50 plus years old. So it actually allows the pipes to be more resilient. Um, the water temperature that leaves has uh, fewer pollutants and it's cooler. And so plants and soil naturally will, um, will filter some of the pollutants out. Um, there are constantly studies going on about the materials used in eco roofs and what kind of materials produce other pollutants. And so we have to keep track as the industry grows to make sure we're not creating more problems. Um, cooling urban areas. If you talk to someone from Chicago or from Atlanta, one of the major reasons that they use eco roofs is to cool the urban core for the e urban heat island effect. So the impacts of having all that pervious, that impervious surface. It absorbs heat during the day and then it glows like an orb when you look at some of those, um, those heat maps at, at night. I don't know if, if anyone's seen those, but when you look at um, the heat emanating off of cities like that, they still emanate heat when it's 3 a.m. in the morning. And so adding green space and in particular adding green roof space really helps to mitigate that. Of course, air quality, oxygen release, carbon sequestration, these are, these are part of the package of benefits. <coughs> Um, we've been really focusing on wildlife habitat and insect habitat and pollinator, in particular pollinator habitat, as we look at um, where Portland is positioned with um, migratory um, corridors and we look at the Columbia River and the Willamette River confluence. This is an important place for birds and for all kinds of insects and um, in our in our minimal monitoring that we've done, because we don't have the necessary tools to do a robust monitoring, um, project, we have found a great deal of um, presence of different types of pollinators and insects. And I believe that our studies are at our table, the BES table inside. So if you haven't seen them, they've got a lot of good examples of the types of things that we found. Um, one of the major uh, benefits is that it prolongs the life of the roof. And uh, for a property owner, um, when you're looking at your long-term investment um, and you want to make sure that um, you know, you want to make your roof as sustainable as possible, but you also want it to pay off. Um, you're looking at extending it um, twice and perhaps even longer by having that soil and plants on that rooftop. And so um, a big element of that is protecting the membrane, which is susceptible to breaking down when, when, it's, um, when it's facing solar radiation or if it's facing um, the elements over time. And so the, so the plants and the soil actually help to protect that. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of different aesthetic value. Um, 
we do focus a lot on the industry and jobs to try to develop and find out where there are opportunities for people to get careers in this work. Um, and then if you're um, trying to achieve lead credit for your building, you can actually get credit for that and um, a, a number of different financial incentives with the city. So there's a lot of benefits to having these projects. And I, I always include this, and it's even funnier now because this slide is kind of old, but now that this Portlandia TV show has come out, um, it, it's, it's humorous that so many people think that we just have a bunch of crazy ideas here. And I, I have sat with folks that have thought that this is just some harebrained Portland idea, and I have to tell people that this is done worldwide. We, we, are, we are a U.S., I would say a U.S. leader in a lot of ways, um, but there are so many leaders now that, that are um, doing a lot of really creative and aggressive things. Um, this is just a small list, um, and of course the Europeans have been doing this for a very long time, um, and we've learned a lot. Um, from them, and I hope you'll be here today. Wolfgang Ansel is one of our speakers, um, and he, he comes from Germany, and he has a great deal of p policy aspect um, that he'll share with us. And uh, Paul Kephart as well um, will be here, and he'll be able to talk about his experiences in a lot of the major kind of iconic projects um, in, here and in Canada as well. That's actually one of them down there on the bottom, right? <laughs> Academy of Sciences in California. So uh, um, another really key element is that people don't, don't really know, um, you know, naturally these projects are on rooftops. Um, a lot of people don't go on rooftops very often. We have 273 eco-roofs in the city of Portland, and it's close to 13 acres in space. So um, proportionately that's not a lot of space, but it is a lot when you start thinking about it in terms of projects. It's, it, it is a great deal of different types of buildings and different, different areas, and we've seen projects that have been around for quite, quite some time here, so we're seeing how they act over time in the built environment. Um, and another point that I like to share with people is that since we started our incentive program that I'll talk about in a little bit, we funded another 125 projects um, for an additional eight acres. So um, the key point there is that you might not know it, but they're all over the city. And they're on a lot of different types of buildings, and they're used in a lot of different ways. And um, a lot of them are accessible, and you can learn a lot more about that. So, yeah. Is that in addition to the uh, 273? Uh, some of them are part of the 273 because they've been completed. Okay. But the first two-year funding cycle just just ended. Okay. So. Um, probably more info than you want to know, but when you get the incentive, you have two years to spend it on your project. Um, so what we see is um, we award the money and then it takes time to develop the design and go through the permitting process. Um, and so we have seen some of those 125 start to come in. <coughs> Any other questions? And so over time, um, this is just a kind of a a nifty graph to show um, over time by land use, we've seen um, pretty consistent growth uh, with a couple of spikes. And it's interesting because um, a couple of the different, oh yeah. Jake, is this the pointer? Uh, oh, I can bring down one for you. Oh, it's okay. No, it's okay. It's fine. This looks like a car alarm thing though. <laughs> okay. So one really key message from this slide, the green color is commercial property. And so Clearly, the majority of our, our rooftops that are vegetated are on commercial buildings, and this is great if you're a business owner, um, partially because there's a, this means there's a lot of examples of commercial properties out there that have them, which means there's a wealth of experience out there and lessons learned and challenges faced that, that you can learn from. Um, but there's also a number of municipal buildings. I think in 2006, the red there, that's our Portland building downtown, which was 18,000 square feet. Thanks. Uh, the 2004 white um, bar there is the uh, 18,000 square foot Broadway building on the Portland State Building. So um, early on we had some large buildings that really got a lot of the square footage, but then over time we've seen it go up and up. And uh, you know, in the last couple of years, I have to say, this is happening during um, an economic downturn. And so um, we're excited to see that there's still projects that are happening um, in the way that they're happening. And we're, we're really hoping that it's positioning us for when, when things start to turn around for development and how we start to look at how we're going to upgrade our buildings, we're really hoping that this becomes something that's more accepted and people are more aware of and, and less afraid of. 
So I just, I'd like to include, because it's such a visual concept, I like to include some of these projects. And these are all funded with our incentive. Um, these are all residential projects. Um, and while uh, we have about three quarters of an acre of space on residential properties, we have over 100 residential projects in the city. So uh, that's kind of a big number when you think about it. It's not necessarily the whole house, but we have several houses that have coverage and we've got when houses or when homeowners couldn't do it on their house, they did it on their garages or they did it on their porches or different ways. So there's a lot more creative uses in the way that a, a home's footprint can be, um, can be uh, improved by incorporating a green roof. Um, we have several commercial examples and uh, one thing I will say is the people that worked on these projects are all in, in the hall here. So um, a lot of the, the reason why I can stand up here and, and, and kind of brag about how cool these pictures are are certainly not because of my handiwork. They're all in the hall. Um, very talented. Um, Mercy Corps headquarters down near the Burnside Bridge. That Great there is now um, supporting solar arrays. Um, the Umpqua Bank in Selwood, uh, the top right picture, and then the 1200 building in downtown on the bottom right. That project came in at $5.10 per square foot. They got a, an incentive for $5 a square foot. They paid 10 cents a square foot. It also has uh, a leak detection system installed in it. And so that was an example of someone who decided to take it upon themselves to really go aggressively at that cost per square foot and try to do what they could to keep it low, just to see if it was possible. And it actually worked. It was a pretty effective approach. So what kind of plant material on that one? That's uh, sedum. And what they did was they went with, um, I believe, pots. And so there's different approaches to planting material. Um, the, pr they all have pros and cons. Um, the, the pros is that the pots are, they have, um, have lived longer, so their survivability is better, but it takes a little longer for them to get established. So over time, you'll see the space between those pots, they'll start to fill in. Probably four inch pot? That's my guess, yeah. A lot of institutional and industrial examples um, we're fortunate enough that um, most of the universities in the area have at least one project. Um, the top right, Shiley Hall, was a LEED Platinum building that was awarded Platinum last year. Um, and St. Andrew's Church, even, um, on Alberta Street has incorporated this in their new design as well. Um, so it's pretty cool to see even, even buildings that uh, you would think would have an inherent challenge in getting an eco roof on. They're still finding ways to do it in a creative fashion and to getting the incentive, which is pretty much the kicker for them. So the real, the real message is we're, we're starting to see that um, we're getting s sort of pointed towards a tipping point. Um, there are a lot of indicators that, that are saying to us that things are starting to move um, in a, with a little bit more momentum. Mo momentum. Um, so for example, uh, they're becoming more conventional. So anywhere that we see a rooftop, we're seeing these types of projects go in. And when I say anywhere, you know, we're looking at the, the house in the top right and different, different types of houses, different types of businesses. But then downtown um, Franklin High School has a batting cage that has an eco roof on it. And you know, when you think about that, um, it, was, it was raised from, um, from a trust that's associated with the high school. But you know, I got a lot of questions from people like, how could you guys do that? How could you put something on a batting cage? And the answer is the batting cage has a roof on it. It's got hard surfaces on it. It generates stormwater runoff off of it. So they took a creative approach and designed a really amazing batting cage that has a green roof. It's pretty neat. And uh, it's also an interesting position because a lot of the buildings around it can see it. So people that live on the, the west side up in the hill can actually look down and see um, a vegetated roof where it would otherwise be a dead space. So. Now, were they able to avoid having to put in some rain and all? I believe they were. So they didn't have to have That's correct. Yeah. Um, so we're excited about this because in the long run, this could mean that, that costs could come down for the average homeowner. Um, you know, if you wanted to have a simple approach, you would have more options at your disposal. Um, and so we think this is a significant thing to talk about, conventional use. Um, I did talk about this a little bit, but multiple purposes. This is where we start to get overlapping, where um, 
when, when you're looking at it from a strictly stormwater um, approach or if you're looking at it strictly from an energy approach, um, you're really looking at just one benefit, but there's a lot of different benefits that you can go after. Um, and so when um, that's the project up on the top right, the Portland State project that they're studying all kinds of things on. Um, but when you start to look at it as a multiple benefit approach, if you think that you can reduce your energy bill when you have an eco roof, and then you can reduce your stormwater fees when you have an eco roof, and you can prolong the life of your roof when you have an eco roof, you start to look at things a little more as a package of benefits. And you can start to look at these and approach, approach design and development of different projects with a lot of different um, benefits um, that you're targeting for. And so, as we, as city planners, look at long-term planning, this means that we can start to look at the way our city develops and use eco-roofs to solve more problems. So we can really look at how, in the long-term, rather than um, solve one problem by starting another one, we can actually look at this in a more comprehensive view. And another indicator that we're excited to see is that the industry is growing. Um, we're seeing a lot of response from practicing and aspiring professionals. This event is our third um, vendor fair type of event, and we've seen a lot of response from the people in the industry that actually make things work and make things go. Um, and so we're excited about that. Um, one nice point is that we, we, we have created sort of a yellow pages of uh, professionals in the city that actually work on these types of projects. It's not a referral list, it's just a, a list of people that have experience, and it's grown by 30% in the last year. That's an additional 20 firms and companies, and I think this is actually outdated now too. It's probably grown more than that. Um, so that's exciting to see, and, and another thing that's not on here is what we're, what we're hearing from people is not only are they um, are there more companies here? But a lot of the companies here are, are partnering with other companies from the East Coast or from Canada. And they're using Portland as a platform and getting business outside of the city. That's a great indicator too. That's a business, that's a, a, a really good indication of business and a, a business evolution. So what we get when we build that network is we get a wider swath of expertise that we can learn from and share and get um, a greater understanding of how this approach evolves over time. And one last thing, um, and I do encourage you, um, depending on your enthusiasm level, um, the Green Roof Info Think Tank is a community-based group that started um, at this event two years ago, um, and four people started it as a small subcommittee. It's grown to 240 members on an online forum. Um, and the whole purpose of it is to, from an industry standpoint and a community standpoint, to look at the different types of barriers that we face that keep this approach from moving forward and then take a community approach at solving those challenges. So everybody in the hall here that's got their, their company and their, their business that they're promoting, um, when we go into that meeting, we kind of all take our jerseys off and we sit down together and we say, well, how can we address this problem and how can we address this problem? so that everybody benefits. And what we've seen a great, um, a great level of enthusiasm from all the members, and we've actually started to work on projects. And they've got some great posters um, there of a project that they're designing for um, an industrial complex out in the Northwest Industrial Area. Right out where I showed that picture from, um, they're designing a habitat um, and biodiverse pilot project for one of their buildings. So we're starting to see these things happen, and it's exciting because it really, when you look at it, it starts to point towards um, a momentum change or a tipping point, as I mentioned. And probably most exciting um, for for us, the um, the people that wait for these projects to get finished, because you know maybe we're a little geeky about it, but um, big, beautiful projects are on the way, um, and in some really interesting areas. Um, the one on the left is called. The Ramona, and if you've been in the Pearl District and driving on 405 on the overpass and seen the cranes out there, um, this is a, a project that's over 30,000 square feet, so it's going to be one of the biggest in Portland. Um, it's integrated with solar panels as well, and it's on an affordable housing, um, uh, an affordable housing property. So there's a lot of elements there that are all coming together on this structure um, happening in the Pearl. Um, and a lot of really interesting projects at, at OHSU and all through the city, we're seeing these types of, of things happening more and more. Um, there are over seven new acres in design and construction, which is also exciting. And uh, 
and yeah, we're just we're just really kind of kind of seeing that as a positive thing. We're seeing the demand the demand is sustained and it's it's continuing to go up. So I included a couple of slides depending on where you're coming from um, to try to tell you what um, what some suggestions would be for how to get involved from a property owner standpoint or a developer or property manager standpoint. Um, this is the best event to come to because everything is all kind of together. And um, the, the, the best thing that I could um, ask you to do is go talk to these people that work in, in the industry and get a feel for the, their approach and um, their level of uh, excitement because everybody is really into what they do. So um, that's a really uh, great thing about, about this industry. But really learn about the benefits to you as a property owner and they'll be different from an industrial property owner to a homeowner, uh, to a business owner, or to a developer. So get an idea of what, what really you have available to you, and um, especially like the incentive. What I would say to a homeowner is that your benefit will really be the long-term life of your roof, and there will be an aesthetic value, and you'll get a reduction on your stormwater fee. But if you're an industrial property owner with a 16-acre roof space, your stormwater fee reduction is going to be substantially larger, and it's a greater benefit plus the, the life of the roof. There's a different package of benefits depending on your, your situation. So consider if you have a home or if you're a developer and you're looking forward, consider what you would need to do in order to get an eco roof on your structure. Um, if the building's not designed yet, it's pretty easy to design it so that it can hold additional weight. Um, if it's already existing and you want to retrofit it, there's some questions you can ask to find out how hard that process will be. Um, but once you've done that, um, and you know, maybe you don't need to do that first, maybe you should meet the EcoRoof professionals, but once you've done that, um, talk to some of the professionals that you meet today and find out what they can do to help you because they'll be able to look at some of the projects that they've worked on and really figure out kind of the next steps for you. And then we offer our incentive twice a year um, in June, uh, the deadline, the next deadline is June 1st, so we'll, we'll start the incentive on April 1st. And then we also have um, another deadline, December 1st. Um, and then in doing so, then you can participate, and this is kind of the, the, the fluffy part, then you too can participate in keeping our rivers and streams clean. Um, it's, you, you know, I, the, uh, without being cheesy, I, to know that your roof is actually contributing to the protection of, of the river that runs right through our city, I think is pretty compelling. If you're a professional, if you're an aspiring professional or if you're a practicing professional in these fields, um, there are a lot of resources that you can, you can use. Um, you know, so I, I think of someone, um, one of the first people I met was a landscape designer and, uh, or I'm sorry, a, a landscape maintenance technician. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to really learn specifically about how their trade could be incorporated into, into eco-roofs. And so it was plant specific and it was maintenance specific. Um, and so what we try to do as the city is try to offer tools and resources to help point people in the right direction. So if that's the kind of thing that, that you're interested in, we've got a number of technical resources. Our eco-roof handbook gives a great overview of some of the technical aspects. Uh, we offer educational seminars um, once a year. We've had about 500 people participate. Um, we've offered it four times and uh, 500 attendees, and that's been a great response. We, we will keep offering that as long as people want to participate in them. Um, we'll also try to coordinate um, whatever other training opportunities there are um, to try to point people in the right direction. We do that with our website and with, uh, with communicating um, with our uh, distribution list via email. Um, and then get and then get some project experience. I know that that sounds kind of like a big order, but um, because of the evolution of the Green Roof Info Think Tank that I mentioned, we're starting to see the possibility of getting hands-on experience is becoming more possible. In other words, your firm doesn't have to go out and get a job in order for you to get experience. And that's really where we're looking at developing opportunities in the long term. Where can people get hands-on experience so that they can learn how it all works and make um, their skill set, adapt their skill set to these types of projects. Um, and so if you're a practicing professional and you're out there trying to get more eco-roof projects, use the incentive to your advantage. Right now, uh, I can say that while we do have a competitive process for the incentive, it's not incredibly competitive. We hope it gets there, but the, the fact of the matter is you have a great chance of getting a project approved if you apply for the incentive. 
And so what that means is if you're out talking to a building owner or a, a property owner, a homeowner or anyone, and you're encouraging them to get an eco roof, have the incentive card as a backup so that you can say, look, and we'll, we'll get you a reduction on the cost. It will help generate more projects. And that's the intent of it, naturally. And then if you are interested in that sort of thing, go and check into the Green Roof Info Think Tank. They have the, the sign-up sheet. The 240 people I mentioned are part of the online forum. Um, the group meets monthly, and I would say about 20 people meet, um, and the cast of characters kind of rotates in and out, but everybody kind of stays in the loop um, online, and it's been very, very effective. Um, and then the, the last thing that I would say for people that get that experience is to share it with others. Um, what we've seen in, at, at this stage of the, of the industry and at this stage of designing and building these types of projects, there can't be enough transfer of information. We're learning a lot of information on every project, and the more we share that, the more we'll all be able to continue to progress. So I keep talking about the incentive, and I haven't really told you what the incentive is all about, but um, we started this program uh, a couple of years ago as part of the Greater Green Initiative. So early on when I talked about the gray infrastructure and then I talked about the green infrastructure, our now mayor, then commissioner Adams, um, put forth this initiative to try to help us shift from a mostly gray approach to a more integrated gray and green approach. And all of the elements that make that green approach up include the green streets that you're probably seeing, especially if you're in Southeast, um, the yard trees and the street trees. If you've heard anything about the tree bait program, it's part of the Greater Green I Initiative. Um, we also are looking at removing invasives um, and protecting natural areas. And then the big element there is 43 acres of eco roofs by 2013. And that's a lot of space. So obviously, that's why we do these types of events, and that's why we encourage people to take advantage of the resources. Our implementation arm, what, we, what we're um, offering to try to help um, move things forward um, is our $5 per square foot incentive. This is available for all approved projects in the city of Portland except Portland-owned buildings. So we can't apply for the incentive ourselves, but we can uh, encourage others to do so. Um, and as I mentioned, when I say all projects, if you have a batting cage, we'll accept your proposal. Um, and uh, you know, like I mentioned, churches, and we've even seen a couple of uh, bike shelters come in. Um, a lot of different types of projects. No idea is too small or too crazy. Do you have a minimum on that? A minimum of square footage? I think we do. do you, Amy, do you know what it is? I think it might be 500 square. No, 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 no. I think it might be 100 square feet. Let me get to you afterwards. Okay, there, there is a minimum, and, it's, and I'll tell you why. Because some people really want to put sedum on their mailbox. <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and the time it takes to, get, to write their $5 check is, uh, is a, long, it's a long time for the, the benefit. Um, so we'll, we'll offer this until 2013. So that's every June, at June 1st and December 1st deadlines until, um, until the 2013 um, fiscal year is over. So I think that's June, middle of the summer. Is that available to other government entities? It is. Which, what, may I ask, which? Uh, metro. Metro, yeah. So we have funded a metro building. Was it the Mead? The county, yeah. I don't think we've we, yeah, we may not have. We would love to have. Absolutely. Actually, if you want to talk about putting one up on this building, <laughs> owned by Metro, I think that would be great. Um, but yes, yes, we would do that. Uh, our website, if you have, oh, sorry. For those of you that pay your water bill, there's an element of your water bill for the Water Bureau that pays BES for the stormwater runoff. And it's, it's calculated based on your impervious surface on your property. Um, and there's a program called the Clean River Rewards Program that um, looks at your percentage impervious surface and will reward you if you reduce that percentage. Um, so 
I don't want to make it sound like it's EcoRoof specific because if you find out you can't do an EcoRoof, you've got a, a, an array of other options that you can choose from. But an EcoRoof does count. So if you put an EcoRoof on 100 square feet of your property that's considered impervious, you get 100 square feet off of that percentage. Um, the, the simple terms is that it's a small amount that adds up over time. And it would not be the reason to do it um, because it doesn't pencil out for just that reason, but when you add it to all the other benefits, it's a sweetener, and it's a good one. What is it outside of the city of Portland? What is there? There, there are. I'm not. I'm not very aware of green roof incentives uh, that are available to Portlanders. Let me ask that. So, something that a Portlander could get outside of what the city offers. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not aware of a lot of things. I know the EPA has some programs, but I know that they're, um, or I think they're urban based for, for city centers. Um, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I can find out more. Um, I thought you were maybe asking if there were other cities that had incentives, and there are. Um, but I'm not sure if any of the counties around are offering anything like that. I don't think has, has anything. But it goes to show you that we need to study more about what the benefits are from these projects in order to um, really compel county governments or agencies to step in that direction. I mean, we've got, we've got pressure to do it here because our river has not been, has not been cared for well enough. And so, you know, we're, we're doing the big pipe in order to solve that on a, uh, you know, on a federal level, but we're also thinking ahead towards um, how do we how do we fix how do we make our situation better without just treating it like a problem and kind of dusting it off. We can we can find ways to design and build so that we don't create more problems down the road. Um, sir, well, why don't you help some of the other communities like Salem? They've got a lot of crappy water that's put in the river. Well, um, we. What I will say is that when we do these types of events, we do outreach to Salem, and um, we've had a lot of people from Salem attend our seminars. Um, I think if we were to try to compel the government in Salem to do it, I'm not sure if, if we would be the right group to do that. Um, it's very possible that the Green Roof Info Think Tank will evolve into that, because it is part of the mission for that group. Um, my personal opinion is it needs to come from a community-based coalition type approach. Um, where it's not confined to a jurisdiction like the city of Portland. Um, I don't get to work in Salem because I, you know, I work, I work for the ratepayers here. So, but I think one one thing I will say is that w the resources we're creating are universal. So um, the more that we can get them out the door to people from Michigan or, who are visiting, the the better. Um, they're they're if if anything, if they're not as effective in other places, they're at least conversational pieces that'll get things moving, and we've seen that happen in Austin, we've seen it in Denver, San Francisco, and on the East Coast in Philly, in DC, in New York. Um, we're seeing conversations happen from offering these types of things. So if you know anyone in Salem that would like to talk and maybe come visit, we'll take them around and show them some of the work we've done. So, sir. Yeah, I'm from Southwest Washington, and it's, you know, it's good to see the efforts, but a little bit disheartening at the same time, you know, because I have very low cost of but is it, you know, when we talk about other areas besides Portland, first thing you think of is uh, federal initiatives. And are there any federal initiatives besides what you mentioned with the EPA that we would see trickling down over, say, the coming years? I mean, it's a great concept. It can apply in many different areas besides just Portland. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something I would be interested in is to see is, you know, yeah, you need from a federal level some organization at least that is allowing for different communities to further develop these type of programs? Mm -hmm. um, one thing I will say, uh, uh, Maria Cantwell introduced legislation um, for a green infrastructure and green roof benefit. I don't think it made it as far as it was intended, um, but I know that we were excited to see it get on the floor 
um, because that means that things are, are being talked about and they're moving forward. I know there was also the green, I'm not gonna remember my details very well, but um, a green infrastructure legislation that was, that was introduced and I don't think that was accepted either. Somebody else might know. Um, there are federal initiatives for federal buildings um, that they need to be more green and I believe that we're seeing, at least in Portland, some of the federal buildings that are being um, retrofitted are, are getting eco roofs or green roofs as part of that. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of us would agree with you that on a federal level we, would, we need to see a little more action. And I, I just look at it like, you know, there are still communities that think this is a crazy idea. So there's a lot of, of misinformation, there's a lot of myths that need to be kind of broken down. And then there also just needs to, we need to move out of the pilot phase and early adopter phase and start to get um, more acceptance of these types of projects. And so we rely on, on what Toronto's learning and we rely on what Vancouver's learning and, and maybe they rely on some of the things that we're learning, but I see a challenge in rural communities. Um, I, I see it, we need to get greater acceptance before we can get out of some of these, um, these more formulated jurisdictions, I think. Um, but it's, I, it's still possible to do these things there. I, you know, the yeah, absence, there's no right, there's no incentive. I don't even know of anybody that's done an eco-roof in Southwest Washington. So. <laughs> they, there might be some people in there that have done, have, have done one in there. I mean, what I would say is that, is that now that we've, I feel like we have a group of, of professionals that have, um, that have developed skills and have portfolios of projects, you're a lot more likely to meet someone who would be willing to go there and do a project. And if you were to say cost is an issue because we don't have the incentive, it's possible that someone would say, okay, well, let's work on the design and see what we can do to bring it back down. Um, many years ago, that might not have been possible. So, um, I, you know, it might be disheartening it now. I, I guess I've got my optimism glasses on because I'm thinking that I'm seeing things get better. And hopefully, um, we'll, look at, we'll look at our options down the road and maybe we'll be able to expand out into other communities. Do that. It's optimistic, but hopeful, so. Do you want to talk about the ITCC? Uh, yes, or do you? <laughs> I, I mean, if you, if you want to. Yeah, I'll just be brief. Um, I'm Amy Chalmowitz, and I work with Matt in the Eco Rubra program, and lots of questions concerning incentives. Um, so the ITCC, the International Green Construction Code, I'm pretty sure that's what that stands for, um, they've proposed um, an overall um, very extensive uh, green construction code that would be nationwide that communities can adopt. And I think that it's going to be very helpful to have um, a code uh, so that there's some kind of standard that communities can, can look to because right now, it's kind of everybody's trying to figure out what's the best way to go. So in Oregon, the state of Oregon is looking at the IGCC's code um, and the green room portion or the eco room portion of that code they're planning on adopting as a voluntary code. And again, this will just help to strengthen the whole um, effort and industry um, in our state. Is that, is that available on a website somewhere? Yeah, it code? is. It is. Um, it's the state uh, building code division. Um, there are some materials on the, the BES uh, table mm -hmm. in the vendor fair uh, from the, um, the state agency. Um, the, the materials are about water conservation, uh, I think gray water reuse, but I think their, their web address would probably be on there. Excellent. Were there any other, any other questions? Thank you, Amy. I wasn't even thinking about, uh, about what we're seeing happen. Um, and, and again, that's a step. Um, so it's, it's exciting to see that step happen. And I was reminded that um, a few of us got to see Wolfgang Ansel talk a little bit last night. And he had a list of all the things that are needed for the market to kind of continue to grow. And so um, I know he's going to dig into that a little deeper later on at 1 o'clock. So I, almost done here. I, we do have a really great website. So when you're when you're looking at possible projects in Southwest Washington, um, all of these resources work as far as um, helping to kind of get your handle on some of the um, on some of the more technical aspects. Um, 
we have a, a blog and then Grit has a website. And we're trying to coordinate all of that so that we can help people find what they need. Um, a lot of the technical resources we have are towards different um, different audiences. So you know, our plant report talks about the the um, level of success we've seen with a number of different eco roof plants in Portland. Um, that was 2008, and so um, it, it's a Portland specific um, kind of update on how certain project plants are doing. Um, we've uh, we have a great tool called the eco roof handbook that I mentioned, which has got kind of an overview. But then we've also created the EcoRoof Guide, um, which is a kind of a do-it-yourself or, or small project guide. And it allows someone to play either the project manager or the do-it-yourselfer and go through the project. And we kind of guide you through making decisions in the process. Um, so these are all for different audiences. And, and you know, last but not least, our cost-benefit evaluation is really a policy tool that can help decision makers look at, um, it's a hypothetical study of the costs and the benefits to both the property owner and the public for an eco roof over a 40 year period. Um, it's a really great tool if you're um, someone that thinks about the economics of these types of things or, or are interested in talking with you know, policy folks or planners. So with that, um, I'll answer any other questions you have, but I wanna say thanks for being here and you, you've got another one? Sorry. Uh, for achieving for achieving same goal uh, I, yeah I mean I will I will say a rain garden will be less expensive than an eco roof um, and if you're talking specifically about stormwater management um, it, you know it will likely cost less to do a rain garden because you're not dealing with the structure but then you're gonna not you're not going to get a lot of the other benefits that the that the eco roof would provide um, there are so many variables it's really hard to to, to say, you know, to say one or the other. Um, and I think it would be very site specific. So for example, if your structure could hold it and you had an intact membrane and you really just needed to do a little modification and then install the plants in the soil, you might be able to get away with doing it at a low cost. So it just kind of depends on what your situation is. Um, we might be able to help you with that, um, the guide. If you have a specific project in mind, we might be able to help kind of look at Look at some of your options with that. So, are those publications available in the trade room? They are. Um, there's hard copies, and if you've got a folder on your way in, and you you have a CD in that folder, they're all available as PDFs on that CD as well. Is this presentation available? Uh, I will be on our website. Okay. Um, if that's if that works for you, if you want it as a PowerPoint, um, you can send me a note, and I'll be happy to put that on there. Uh, permits, can you touch on, does this have any impact on the building permits? Yes, it does. Um, the permit process uh, is designed to make sure that um, the structure can actually hold the weight. Um, when you do a typical re-roof project in Portland, as a homeowner, if you're just doing a conventional re-roof, you don't typically have to get a permit as long as the design of the roof doesn't change very much. Once you add weight, you're gonna trigger a permit. I would say more often than not, in fact, probably 100% of the time, when you're adding an eco roof to where a conventional roof once sat, you are gonna trigger um, a permit. Um, the good news is that our permitting office is well versed in eco roofs now that we've been throwing so much money at projects and they're all coming through the permit office. Um, so the the, the part that is, is um, I guess, where the rubber hits the road right now is that we're trying to be able to interpret um, all the, the variations in design so that our permit review staff and our structural engineers can say, yes, it's good to go, or you need to do a little more work on it. Um, so for structural, for a building permit, um, anything that's over 200 square feet in size and within, I believe, five feet from the property line um, will will need to have a permit and that will have to go through the structural process. Um, there's also a zoning permit aspect too. Um, so if you are close to the property line, then you might have to trigger, you might trigger a per, uh, zoning permit as well. Um, if you're working on a shed in your backyard to store your, uh, 
your lawnmower in, um, and it's smaller than 200 square feet, you can actually get around the permit um, if it doesn't trigger anything near the property line. But we still really encourage you to, if you're, if you're not savvy with structural engineering or, or lumber charts, and you, you really just need to make sure that it's going to be able to hold that weight. Um, go. Yeah, if you're required to go through a building permit process, you'll need to have a stamped, um, you'll need to have it stamped by a structural engineer. Um, that's, there's no question. Yep. So. Now, one other thing um, would be good for like, developers to know if you do commercial buildings is the FAR bonus. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, another benefit that I did not include here is the Florida area uh, ratio bonus. And so um, that is a benefit in Portland city center. So in the central uh, Portland city, if you are a developer um, looking at um, buildings that have height on them, most of them, um, you have a height limitation to where to how big you can build your building. And there's a number of different things that you can do with that building to get a bonus called a floor area ratio bonus. Um, and so an eco roof was added to that, that menu of items and for um, if you were going to have 100% coverage on your roof, you would get three square feet per square foot of eco roof added. Um, I believe that's right, is that right, Michael? Yeah, um, so um, the, the point there is that you're going to get a reward for adding a green roof and so if you're a developer and let's say times are a little bit moving a little bit better than they have been lately, then you'll have more leasable space in your building and you'll get that back um, as an investment. You'll get it back from people that, that lease that property. Uh, I don't want to be too specific because I know there's some there's some nuances to it, but but yeah, if you um, I'm forgetting my numbers right now, but basically if you um, reach a certain threshold, you get a one to one. Um, if you're around the middle, uh, you know percentage, you get a one to two, and then you get a one to three if you're sick. I think it's ninety and above. So. Rule of thumb for a city block is basically Okay. By the time you take out the area, if you can't, it's hard to get hundred. You're close. Right. So um, if you're familiar with the Eagles in the Pearl District or in the South Waterfront, um, a lot of those projects uh, receive the FAR bonus. So, any other questions? Does the department also handle the environmental services? I believe it's not part of our, I'm not an expert with this, but I don't think it's part of our stormwater management manual. I'm not sure. It's, it's not been a 100% accepted um, stormwater management tool, and we're, we're getting a little bit more into it. Um, my minimal understanding is that that also has a lot of variables that have not been 100% tested um, as far as the city's concerned. So that's a, that's a roundabout way of saying yes, but no. Kind of. <laughs> Um, I heard a rumor that um, people or that some group was starting to consider designing uh, eco roof um, specifically tailored to provide habitat for some local threatened or endangered shorebirds. Can you tell me anything about that? Do you know who you heard about <laughs> was doing that? No, I, I, I think if I thought about it hard, it was a, a student. We were just chatting. Okay. Um, I, I can't speak specifically to that. What I can say is that last year um, we were um, lucky enough to bring out uh, Dusty Gedge, who is an expert in London, who has designed, um, I, think, I think it was a million square feet, some ridiculous number of square foot of green roof in a London cor um, migratory corridor for a specific bird species. And of course, I'm not a birder. I'm not going to remember the type of bird it was. Um, but uh, what's that? The red start. The red start. Thanks, Paul. Um, and so uh, we, we heard a lot from him. Um, he was actually brought out by the Audubon Society. And then uh, we also had Stefan Bernison, who was, um, I think, Dusty's predecessor, who came at the beginning of this month. And really, they look at biodiversity and habitat benefits um, 
um, really, the, they really have um, done a lot of work and research into figuring out what different things you can do with the design of um, really the microclimates and how and how the topography of an eco roof um, can change to benefit different types of insects and birds. Um, and so from them, I think we've had a lot more conversations um, sprout up here in the professional community on what we could do um, to benefit some species here. I'm not familiar with the shorebirds necessarily, but um, again, not being a birder, I'm not going to remember the species, but the streaked, streaked horned lark is a bird that is out on the Columbia Slough, um, that, use, sorry, that uses the Columbia Slough. And uh, for those that have not been out there, there's a lot of big, flat industrial buildings out there. And as they come in, we're looking at the possibility of habitat for this bird um, to be impacted. And uh, this bird is also up for consideration um, to be considered um, a species of concern. And so they're looking at possible ways to, well, better understand what the habitat needs are and then look at incorporating some of those needs into a design. Um, and luckily, I think through that conversation, I believe that Stefan Bernison and his team might come back and um, contribute to that, the actual design of that project. Um, so the, the, the bottom line is that I think there might be a specific conversation going on that I'm not aware of, but I know that in a lot of circles, it's becoming a, um, a benefit that people are getting more familiar with. Um, and I think it's certainly an important one. And I, for me, I look at the Columbia Slough as just acres of possibility out there for you know all the rooftops. There are buildings with rooftops that are 12 acres in size on the Columbia Slough. It's giant. As gray water? I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any specific project. I have heard that talked about before. I, I know that, um, well, t you know, Tom Lipton would be a good person to talk to. I know he kind of, kind of went like that when somebody brought it up. Do you, do you know? Or? Well, there's a student doing uh, a project at PSU, uh, maybe a couple students on uh, passing gray water, uh, you know, big gray water over um, a green roof, start, starting with that to the um, Paul, come this afternoon and I'll show you several examples. Oh, great. Paul Kephart will be speaking this afternoon and he's got examples. That's awesome. Thanks. Sir? The built up roof is uh, usually cheaper than the EPDM flat roof. Have you had any luck uh, putting a green roof on top of a, a new uh, built up roof? trying to think specific to projects, and I'm not aware of a specific, I can say yes, but I, I don't have any specifics for you. I know there has been, I just can't, I can't think of which project it was. Um, we will probably have more information. I think either Tom or Casey at the BES desk can kind of point you to a specific project. And I will say that um, where we get, when we get a good question like that, um, is that everybody that we've given the incentive to has to write a report for us that we post on our website. And so our goal is to get the project name and then go find out what they did and what they learned through that process so that you can take that to your project. Um, so I, it's a great question. I hope, um, I hope maybe I can count on my colleagues to answer it for you. That's me dodging the question. But. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate you being here. And um, enjoy the day. I appreciate it. Thanks.